what are we going to do today? We are going to talk about three court cases that every notary should know. And what we're going to do is we're going to take some fairly complicated, fairly dense cases that are frankly pretty boring, and we're going to break them down, and we're going to look at some of the lessons that are in them, some of the reminders of what it means to be a notary and what is important about being a notary. And you see a lot of praise for notaries in these cases. Sometimes it's hard to find a lot of praise for notaries. And so you come here, right? And then you read these cases, there's a lot of really good stuff. And we're going to talk, too, about how some of the very core principles of being a notary are really what's going to keep you out of trouble. And, and, and at its core, you've heard these things many times. Things like personal appearance, having the, the person there when they sign. Things like satisfactory evidence and making sure that person is who they say they are, whatever that means in your state. And also making sure that that signature is theirs. These, these simple steps which seem pretty straightforward, are things that can really keep you and some of these people we're about to talk about out of hot water. And we're going to do this in a way that tells some, some stories about what happens when things go wrong. I get a lot of questions of, well, what could go wrong? And how important is it really if I make a mistake? Well, many times mistakes don't get caught, or many times they are not that important. But when they do, things get really nasty, if you will. And we're going to talk about some of those cases. We're going to break down three cases. We'll go through them one at a time. But the key is to have fun. So you got a lawyer up here, we're talking about court cases, sounds kind of boring, but we're gonna have fun. It's gonna be fun, right? Yeah. Are we committed to have fun? Yeah. All right, good, okay. Well, first of all, who am I? I, um, I do a lot of different things, but I am an attorney, a fairly nice guy despite all that, and um, I actually do a lot of different things, but my main area of work is providing advocacy for people who are receiving mental health services in different facilities in uh, all of San Diego County. So the place, we used to have these large mental institutions, as you probably know, we closed them down. It's my job to make sure people are being treated appropriately, treated like human beings. Also, I do a lot of permanent supportive housing, getting homeless people off the street and into housing. And I'm a notary, and I'm a notary instructor. I teach uh, thousands of notaries. And so today, we're going to talk about, well, kind of a mix of all of those things, probably, if you think about it. Um, this is the disclaimer that you always have to put up if you're an attorney. This is not legal advice. If you go out and do some horrible thing after this and say, Mike Phillips is my lawyer and he said it was OK, I did not say that. I'm going to run the other way. So. Not legal advice, OK? All right, so what are our objectives today? We're going to review these court cases to examine mistakes made and damages that occurred. And then we're going to understand the importance of following standards of professional care. And we're going to learn tips to avoid liability from notarizations. I think what I want all of you to do is imagine those times that you've been in those difficult situations where you weren't quite sure what to do. And maybe you took a little leap or got a little bit creative or you thought about it. And imagine that that's probably what each of these individuals in these three cases did. And maybe they were a little sloppy, maybe they weren't. Maybe they got too creative and thought, well, what's the big deal? And we're going to find out what the big deal is. And you're also going to see that in these cases, there is a case that everyone's trying to get to. There's a situation, there's a story that people are trying to address, a remedy of. And all of a sudden, everything goes sideways because there's a question about a notarization. And then the whole case just becomes about that notarization. And in many cases, possibly all, I don't want to spoil anything. We're also not going to spoil Avengers or Game of Thrones, so don't even think about it. <laughs> we never even get back to the original story. We never even get back to what we were in, in court about. So we're talking about, really, maybe justice that was never done, unless we talk about the justice that was done in the area where the notarization, uh, the rules needed to be held up. But justice maybe never done in the actual case itself and justice tied up for other people who are trying to get into that courtroom. So we're going to look at um, the impact in a lot of different areas. All right, so we're going to start with Bessigny versus Vermillion. The names in these cases are not easy, and there's a lot of characters. So it's sort of like, I liken a lot of these court cases to uh, Shakespeare, in that you, you know that there's something in there that's supposed to make sense, and you got to read it 100 times before you can figure out what's going on. But the language is so thick and difficult to understand that it's really hard to keep track of what's going on. So I'm going to paint a picture in each of these cases of the, what the actual case is supposed to be about. And if you find you're struggling to keep track of all the characters, don't worry too much because everything, as I said, is going to go sideways and suddenly become about a notarization that was or was not performed correctly. So in this case, We've got a situation where there is a company called Vermilion. They've got seven different board of directors. And there's this political maneuvering that's going on. We've got um, someone, there's two seats that are coming up for election. And the board eliminates one of the seats. And you can tell these people are jockeying for position and jockeying for power in this board of directors. So two individuals decide to initiate this lawsuit and say, hey, you can't just eliminate one of those board seats without going through the proper process. We had two people lined up. We, we had all kinds of plans for these board of director seats. So the court is about this 
company just eliminating a board seat, rightly or wrongly. To get this case into court, it's filed in Delaware, and the two individuals who are shareholders in this company that file suit are two individuals named Bessenier and Goggin. Goggin's an attorney, but he is not the attorney that is, that is leading the case. They've got a separate law firm in Delaware that's, that's doing that. And so the process, we're going to see the rules, but the process shows that to file certain complaints in this Delaware court, you have to have any complaints that you make notarized. That's the basic rule. So no problem for Goggin. He's an attorney in Pennsylvania, and he's got a notary in his office that we're going to talk about. Her name is Bennett. The problem is this Bessenye guy. Bessenye is this high roller who is out floating around in a yacht in, in you know, the island somewhere and just really can't be bothered to stop doing what he's doing. He's having too much fun, and he needs some stuff notarized. And he basically says, I'm, I'm in the islands. I'm somewhere far away from notaries. What should we do? So at the end of the day, what is decided is Goggin, the other individual, the attorney in Pennsylvania, tells his notary, well, we got to get these notarized. So she just notarizes three documents saying that this guy was there in the Pennsylvania office when the reality is he's way out you know, in the Greek Isles or somewhere like that. So multiple different documents. And then, so, so that's the setup, right? That's the story. And of course, the other side, Vermilion, the corporation, they realize, OK, we've got an angle here. Because if we can show that these documents were improperly notarized, then that means they were improperly filed with this Delaware court. Maybe we can pull the legs out from this whole thing. It's like a Jenga puzzle. You pull that piece out, maybe the whole thing falls down. And in doing so, if that's what's going to happen, we'll never even get to the actual issue of whether it was right or wrong to eliminate these board seats, right? So that is the case. And then if we're mad at somebody here, who are we mad at? Are we mad at the notary in the, in the attorney's office who notarized these? Are we mad at the lawyer who told her to do it? Are we mad at Bassenye, who's so busy out there having the time of his life that he can't be bothered? Are we mad at the Delaware lawyer who went ahead and filed the case? So all of these characters, we have to figure out what we're going to do with them. So we got the setup, right? OK. Any questions so far? No. All right, good. OK, so now we're going to get into some boring stuff. But in the way that works in the law is we have a setup like that. And then the normal human reaction is to get this gut level, I know the answer. I have a strong emotion. Well, unfortunately, in the law, now we have to look at, well, what does the rule say? And are there other cases? Are there other precedents here? And so that's the analysis, and that's the way it has to build. We all have an idea already, probably. You're thinking, like, I already know who I'm mad at. I already know who I want to get in trouble here. But in the law, we have to look at what is the rule, and then we have to interpret it, and then are there other cases that lead up into that that we're stuck with? There's a concept called stare decisis, which basically means all the other cases leading up to this one we have to build on those, and we can't just ignore what came before if we didn't like it. So the lawyers on one side are going to put a bunch of cases together that they think backs up their position. Lawyers on the other side are going to put up a bunch of cases that they think backs up their position, and then we've got to figure out if either one of them is right and what we're going to do about it. So OK, the plaintiffs allege that the individuals breached their fiduciary duties by eliminating the board seat. We, this is what we, we, we laid out. They further requested declaratory and injunctive relief, relief, which basically means we want them to stop. Stop it and undo it. Make it not ever happen. Um, that's what they're requesting from the court. To allow its shareholders to elect two directors at the upcoming annual stockholder meeting. The regular processing of this action was derailed, and derailed will be the theme for all these cases, because the defendants learned that the signatures of one of the plaintiffs had been improperly notarized. So the rule in this Delaware court, and the rules are going to be different everywhere. So don't get caught up on, well, what is the rule on, uh, in the Delaware court, because probably none of you are going to be in the Delaware court. The rules that are underlying all of these cases are those core concepts, again, of personal appearance, satisfactory evidence, making sure that signature is the person who's supposed to be signing it. But right now, we've got to figure out, in Delaware's world, so what are their rules? Their rule requires, as I mentioned, that all complaints that are filed with them have to be notarized by a qualified individual for each named plaintiff. Now, this guy, Basenye, sent in three different complaints, all saying he was in this law office in Pennsylvania. He was no, never anywhere near that law office in Pennsylvania. And maybe he doesn't even know. I mean, this Bessenye guy, I mean, he's probably like, I don't know, notarization, how does that work? I have no idea. And I think that's been a theme of this conference, too, as I've heard in different, in, uh, different presentations, that we assume as notaries, how could these people not know these things? But the reality is a lot of people don't. A lot of employers don't know. A lot of lawyers don't know. So one of the things we have to do is educate everyone around us as to what the rules are. And then if they still try to break the rules, then that's a different story. But we should not assume that everybody knows. Now, it may be that the court decides, too bad, you should have known, and we're going to hold you to it. 
But I think we, as educators and notaries, we need to get the word out and say, this is what we can do and this is what we can't. Okay, so the defendants allege that although each of the three documents were, pur were purportedly signed by Bessonnier, and here's the thing, there's no doubt that he signed it. He says he signed it, everyone agrees he signed it. In some of these cases, it's, well, did he really sign it? Is there even really a Bessonnier at all? Does he even exist? You know, there's cases where that's the big mystery. In this one, he's real, he signed it, probably had it faxed over, he just was never in that office. And the question becomes, are we stuck now? Is this little rule of personal appearance so important that we're not gonna let this big case go to court? Or are we gonna say, sorry, the rules are the rules, and we're gonna uphold that, and everything falls apart? Okay, Goggin is the Pennsylvania attorney. He caused Bennett, the legal assistant, to notarize these verifications. And mixed in this, you're probably already thinking about this too, is this idea of a employee notary and having a boss, maybe a lawyer, maybe not, saying, hey, do this. You know, we all have our gut feeling or some of us personal experience in they're making me do something I'm not supposed to do. So early in this case, I'm thinking this Bennett person, was she just sloppy? Did she not care? Was she confused? Or was this Goggin breathing down her neck and saying, just do it. I'm the lawyer, you just do it. You can start to see from the language in the case that they appear to be a little bit sympathetic to Bennett because they're already saying that the attorney caused Bennett. So you're feeling this sort of, he made her do it. And this idea, and we'll talk about it in one of the other cases of uh, whether employers have responsibility for the people that work for them. In many cases, but not all, employers have responsibility for the people that are working for them, as long as it's during normal work hours during the scope of their business. The case talks about the role and the purpose of the notary, and I, I like when they sort of uh, mention some of the core values of what being a notary is all about. It's about attesting to the correctness and the truthfulness of the document, have her signature notarized in order to confirm the authenticity of the signature. I think a lot of times we get caught up in, hey, I wanna do loan signing, hey, I wanna make some money, hey, and those things are great, that's, very, that's important stuff. But I think sometimes we forget the core principles are extremely important and why we exist. This concept goes back all the way back to ancient Rome and before that, the importance of making sure that really somebody is not getting away with something shady and power is not getting away with affecting the powerless. We are someone that can hold back bad things from happening. And so these things are important to remember that that's why we're there, confirming the authenticity. This is not just a ministerial position. A ministerial is someone who just stamp, rubber stamps something because it's their job and they don't really put any thought into it. There's a lot of thought that needs to go into what we do and why we do it. So what they start to do in the case, they start to reference other cases. I mentioned before, the lawyer's gonna look for other cases. Sometimes the court will uh, look for its own cases and, and see what they think is important. They're talking about how personal appearance of a signer is fundamental to the purpose of notarization. That's from this Bokey's estate case. Um, the notary knows that she is confronted, or he is confronted by the signer. Another case in Frey, that the notary knows that he is confronted by the signer. In other words, they're building this case that, look, this is a big deal. Personal appearance is a big deal. It's not just some random thing, so you can start to feel which way the case is going. This is important. Personal appearance is important. This dude's not even there. And when I think about it, too, I think there's only a few basic core concepts of notarization. So as soon as you skip one of those, we're already on some pretty thin ice because then at what point do we just say the whole thing is a joke if we don't say that each step is important? Um, this is a really interesting quote in the case. They're basically saying, we know shady stuff happens all the time, but we're not gonna endorse that. So they reference a downing court that says, while it's all too common a practice for notaries public to affix their seals to documents not signed in their presence, such a practice, however, is clearly unlawful and should not be condoned for the evils of such an unlawful practice are readily apparent. I like this, this is the court really sort of getting real. Like we know this stuff happens, we're not naive, but you're in front of us now and we are not gonna let you get away with these kind of shenanigans. I mean, if the court looks the other way, then what's the point? So they reference this Parfi case. There's a Parfi case and, and, and this Parfi case basically says, is it too harsh to follow that rule so closely that we're gonna blow the whole case? I mean, this is, a, I get it, this rule's important and all that's great, but we got this huge case over here, you're not gonna tell me we're gonna blow this whole case over this little rule? And so Parfi talks about is, how important is it and is that defect enough to throw the whole case out? And, and would it be too harsh to do so? So these are the things that are on the plate. And in these cases, they're sort of laying out these different arguments. In, in law, law is very interesting in that everyone thinks there should be a black and white answer to everything. In fact, when you go to a lawyer and the lawyers just talk forever and you say, just yes or no, I just want yes or no. And the answer of course is, well, it depends. <laughs> but it's true, it depends. It depends on a million different things. And so what they're doing here is they're laying out all these different arguments and will ultimately go with one. 
I came from a science background. I was a biology major, thought I wanted to be a doctor. And in science, everything narrows down to the one answer. In law, it's as broad as you can come up with arguments. And so what they ultimately decide is not necessarily right. It's just what that group of people thought made the most sense at that time. And we're hampered by what came before. You're kind of boxed in by what came before. You can't totally go, sometimes you can go rogue, but very often you cannot go rogue. So the court's analysis on this was that Bessenier's signature was notarized in Pennsylvania, even though he was not in the United States. Under Pennsylvania law, his failure to appear at the time the notariz notarizations took place renders the notarizations invalid. So we know the, the notarizations can't be valid. We skipped a huge step, the personal appearance. His verifications, therefore, are also invalid for the purposes of rule. So in other words, because the notarizations are flawed, and we just said you can't file these complaints in this Delaware court unless they're notarized, the dominoes are starting to fall. The, 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 the notarization falls apart, and now the court case, the, the complaints that have been filed are starting to fall apart as well. So that issue is the defendants, the Vermilion Corporations, attempt to dismiss the action, and they're going to be able to do that or not based on whether these actions rose to the level of a deliberate violation. In other words, did they do it on purpose, and was this some scheme, and was this something? Because, you know, a court case is like a chess game. Everyone's looking for every angle, and some people good legal angles, some people shady angles. Were they doing this on purpose to try to get an advantage? So we're going to break down each individual person. This is the case breaking them down. See, what are we going to do with each one of these people? So we're going to look at the signer. So this is Bessenye. This is our uh, fancy rich guy on his yacht, um, you know, out and about in the ocean somewhere on the other side of the world. His signature appears on each of the documents. And this is what's interesting. Other signing options had been available. So this, to me, is very interesting. What it says in the rules is that these documents have to be notarized to be filed in the Delaware court. or there's two other options they could have used, and they didn't. Or they could have been notarized in any other jurisdiction anywhere, and the Delaware court would have accepted it. So anywhere else they could have had a notary, presumably wherever the heck Bessenier was on his yacht, could have notarized and they would have accepted it. Or, and this is the really easy out, they could have just added this language that says, I swear under penalty of perjury that this is true, and not even get it notarized at all. So there was multiple other ways to do it. They, just did, they either didn't research it, or this notary was just really sloppy or was just under some serious pressure from this attorney to get it done. So we're starting to lose sympathy here, right? Because there's other ways that it could have been done and frankly, other ways it could have been done easily, but nobody researched it, nobody looked that up. He consulted a Pennsylvania attorney to see if the latter could notarize. He didn't really consult, the, the, the attorney was his partner in this lawsuit. So he asked this uh, attorney, is there anything we can do? He basically, there's emails everywhere that are this guy saying, I'm in the islands, I don't know how to do this, can I get this notarized? And there's emails to the law firm notary problem, we have a notary problem, and then another email, never mind, no problem anymore, and, and, and that, that becomes relevant, as you can imagine, right? Okay, so now let's look at the notary's conduct. So her seal appears on each notarization. She stamped them all. She was acting as a legal assistant to the attorney. She notarized each document, even though she was obviously aware that the signer was not present. And there were steps she took to make sure she could notarize, and they were not reasonable. So why don't we, let's look at some of these steps. Don't read ahead because they're funny. Oh, well, they're not funny if you're her. <laughs> All right. She did not review the state's notary booklet. She did not use the telephone number to call the, the governmental agency that oversees notaries. She did not call the, consult the National Notary Association. NNA gets a plug in this case. Did, did rely on Google, but could not remember any details. So when they said, how did you figure out you could do this? Well, I Googled it. Well, what did you Google? Uh, and she did use a credible witness, which is great because there is such a thing as a credible witness, but it has absolutely nothing to do with the problem she was trying to solve, right? We use credible witnesses for various things, but mainly we use them to back up someone's identity when they don't have identity. We weren't worried about Basenia's identity. We were worried that he wasn't in the room. So how are you going to do that with a credible witness? And I don't even know who the credible witness was. They didn't even get into that. So she's like, don't worry, I Googled it. We're fine. And, uh, <laughs> And this, actually, I lost a little bit of sympathy for the notary, because it was one thing when I imagined her as the, my mean old boss is making me do it. But when she's like, nah, I got this, boss. I Googled it. It's fine. I'm starting to maybe lose a little bit of sympathy for her, because you know, there's a lot of better ways to do it than that. Um, the fate. So what happens to her? The, the court basically says, although she acted contrary to her responsibilities, she ought to have taken steps beyond a simple Google search and disciplinary action is a matter for the Pennsylvania authorities. So that's sort of a subtle way of saying, we're sending her to the principal's office. We aren't gonna deal with that here, but she's going over there to deal with the Pennsylvania, presumably Secretary of State, 
and whatever happens to Bennett is not our problem, but this does not look good. Off you go, Bennett. And there's a little sympathy for her because they use wording like, um, she's toiled under the services of this uh, attorney that she works for. I'm like, toiled under the services? Wow, that's heavy. But um, a, little bit of, a little bit of sympathy for her, but I, whatever happened to her, I don't know. I tried to Google her. <laughs> I can't remember where I Googled her or how I Googled her. Maybe I'll call the NNA and ask them what happened. Um, they probably won't want to talk about that. Um, okay, so what happens to the attorney? So the attorney claims he relied on the notary. He throws her under the bus. And you know, but maybe rightly so. Maybe he's like, you're a notary. You're not just supposed to know this stuff. I mean, we just talked about um, the education necessary for people to understand. Was this, and that, when, now when you're an attorney, there's an assumption you know every law. If you get yourself in trouble, it's you're an attorney you should have known. So he's going to get no mercy. None. But the reality is it's like going to a foot doctor and saying, hey, can you operate on my brain? It's not the same thing, right? You don't know every law, but once you're in a courtroom, you know every law, or so thinks the judge. But it's entirely possible he didn't know. And he's probably like, she told me it was fine. She told me it was great. So we don't know. But they basically said, we're sending him off to the state bar, and we'll let them take care of what happens to him. So he gets to go to his principal's office, and Bennett gets to go to hers. And this is not looking good for the fate of the case, by the way. Fate of the Delaware counsel that filed the case, these lawyers are ultimately responsible for the documents they filed with the court. Now you would think that this law firm is probably like, look, those guys did that over there. We don't know what that was. We don't know. But in the deposition, it comes out that multiple emails are going to these guys saying, I'm in the islands. I don't know where I am. And one of the attorneys for this case is complaining, saying, every time I try to find this guy, he's in a different country. I can never figure out where he is. And then at one point, Bessonnier says, I got a notary problem. And, there, and then he says, like two minutes later, it's fixed. And these guys are like, great. And then they go on about their day. Now, they probably had other bigger fish to fry. But unfortunately, we're going to zero in on that and say, you knew, and you didn't look into it. So the signer was in a different country each time counsel spoke with him. So they had to understand there's a good chance he was not in a Pennsylvania law office getting something notarized. Now, the court's saying the plaintiff, so Goggin and Bessonnier, achieved short-term benefits by avoiding compliance with the notary laws. With some thought and patience, the entire problem addressed in the memorandum opinion could have been circumvented. Again, if they would have taken either of those two options, notarize it somewhere else, add that statement. This whole thing, we wouldn't even be talking about this. We'd be talking about the actual case, which is now a distant memory, right? We're not even talking about the case anymore. Dishonesty in the course of litigation is a tempting marker of bad faith. So now they're thinking about, this is like a parent saying, how badly are we going to punish you? Did you do this on purpose? Was it an accident? And of course, it's impossible in many cases to find out. The conclusion is they decided, you know what, we're throwing the whole thing out. We're throwing it all out. There was just too many problems here. The notarizations were faulty. Therefore, filing it in Delaware was faulty. We don't know if you did this on purpose or not. We're not going to punish you over the top, but we're throwing the whole thing out. So this whole case just went nowhere, basically, because of that. All because, and you can imagine, let's go back in time. Let's imagine some uh, a, a notary in, in her office, and the boss says, uh, hey, we need something notarized. She goes, hold on a second. Yeah, I think we're good. Boom, 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 and on about her day. Probably 30 seconds in her life, they were never thinking anything was going to come from it. I think what we all need to do here is, number one, well, we've got some objectives here, some practice tips. Always insist on personal appearance. And really, in almost every rule, I'm a California notary, and California has probably more rules than everybody else, but there's almost always an exception. But before you use the exception, be very careful. So there's exceptions to personal appearance. There's ways to do it without somebody there, but it's tricky. There's ways to do things, all the steps that are exceptions, but they are tricky. So anytime you are going to start to go off the beaten path, do so very carefully. And remember that as notaries, we have unlimited liability. And we can have the entire responsibility land on our shoulders. Um, so educate yourself. One of the things about coming to these conferences, I mean, I, I'm not so worried about you guys. I'm worried about the people who are not here, right? And that's something, too, in your communities, if you can, and I know a lot of you do, trying to raise the bar on requirements for education, trying to raise the bar on educating your peers, because these are the kinds of things we can prevent. I mean, this Bennett person, what a nightmare. Can you imagine this whole case and Bennett's in the, oh, oh my gosh, oh, why did I do it that way? Um, don't be pressured by your supervisor. I know that's very easier said than done. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of the notary hall monitor when someone comes to me. Mike, do I have to show you my ID every time? Yep. Do I have to do this? Yep, every time. Why? Because that's what the rule says. That's what, and I could get in a lot of trouble. You wouldn't want that. And actually, in California, it's a misdemeanor to solicit the notary to do something the wrong way. So I'll sometimes say, and it's a misdemeanor to try to get me to do it wrong. And I know you're not trying to do that, so, <laughs> right? Right? Speaking to the microphone. 
Um, call the NNA hotline. You know, these are kinds of things that could have been handled so easily if someone had called the NNA hotline. Obtain a healthy amount of errors and emissions. I cannot say enough about errors and emissions. And I'm here today, I'm not selling anything. I have nothing to sell. But I cannot tell you enough how important it is to have errors and emissions. Three things that I tell my students. Number one, it gives you peace of mind, which frankly is the most important thing ever because you're probably not going to need it. Two, it makes you more marketable if you want to do business with lenders and do loan signing. And three, if you actually need it, it's there to take care of court costs. It's there to take care of attorney's fees. It's there to take care of uh, judgments if necessary. Errors and emissions is incredibly important. And uh, the CEO of NNA was in my session yesterday, and, and uh, it's my understanding that the NNA's position is that $25,000 is a good amount. I get $100,000, but that's just me. Um, you know, you do whatever you need to do, but really protect yourself because if something goes wrong, there's no one there to look out for you. It's just you, okay? All right. You know, I mean, uh, really, she Googled it. She tried, right? I mean, <laughs> well, but you know, I'll tell you what's not an honest mistake. Of <laughs> I got this, boss. I got an idea. They'll never figure it out. We've got a plan. That's not an honest mistake. And so I think that, that right, and I'm not saying it necessarily would have saved her, but I'm guessing most of you, if you're here, you guys are not looking to get away with all kinds of shenanigans. So I would imagine that any mistake that most of the people in this room, in this conference, would make, and any, any, any NNA members generally would make, would be an honest mistake, right? Um, that's what we're worried about. And frankly, if you're trying to get away with a dishonest mistake, well, I'm not rooting for you. So I hope you don't get away with it. So that is true, but that would be an argument that you would need to make. That you, and we're going to talk about bonds, too, because bonds are important, and that's going to come up in the next case. Um, so yes, honest mistakes. But the reality is, Everyone, we're all here trying to do the right thing, and every once in a while you're gonna miss a stamp. I, I, thought, I think I'm perfect when I'm notarizing, and every once in a while someone will say, you missed a stamp. No, I didn't, and I'll look, oh my gosh, I did, I actually did. So, you know, we're human, we're human, and that's what, in my opinion, the E&O is for, for a human mistake, not an intentional one, thank you. In Delaware, they said, if you're sending in complaints, they have to be notarized, and that's what they did, they did but they did it wrong. Or, they could be notarized really anywhere. Anywhere that, that Basenye could have gotten something notarized, they would have accepted it. They would have said, good enough. Wherever you are is fine. Or the last one, which would have been the easiest one of all, this is what I would have done had I researched it, but they didn't research it because Bennett said we got this, was that they could attach a, a sentence that basically says, I declare that everything on this statement is true under penalty of perjury. In other words, he's putting himself on the hook for it. And that's really what we do as notaries. When we do jurats, when we do affidavits, we are putting someone on the hook for perjury, or worse, if they're lying. It's that idea, you know, Michael Clausen, who is the expert, the guru, and I'm honored to call him a friend, he talks about how that oath is really to make you pause for a minute before you notarize and say, do I mean this? Is this really something I want to put my name on and I want to get involved with? You know, we, I always look at it from the notary's end. I, when when, when uh, Michael and I present, I'm always the, the lawyer who says, well, this is what the law says. And he's the one that says, we should be, he's a lawyer as well, we should be doing better. We should be raising the bar. And the next case you're going to see is all about that. Um, so the case here is that what does the law say, but also should we be raising the bar higher than that, and then what does that look? And that's really what the NNA is all about, following the law, but also raising the bar on all of us. And I think there's times when I don't always agree with raising the bar too high if it doesn't track what the law says, but we're going to talk about this next case where that becomes very relevant and where that's something that uh, is, is at issue. So in this case, I would have just sent this guy and said, just add this. Well, I would have asked Bennett, if I was the lawyer, I would have asked Bennett, just add this phrase, I declare under penalty of perjury, send it to him, he'll sign it, he'll send it back. We know that's possible because they did send it to him, and he did sign it, and he did send it back. He signed it. There's no debate. Nobody's saying he didn't sign it, but he wasn't there. And Bassanio probably has no clue that he was supposed to be there. And the attorney's probably like, yeah, my, my notary said it's fine. And the notary's like, yeah, I Googled it. What are you talking about? I Googled it. Credible witness. I'm like, what, what does that have to do with anything? Credible witness? That doesn't help here. So I think everyone thought they were doing something right, but they were sloppy. I, I can't, now there's ways you seek uh, tactical advantages in a case. This doesn't seem like that's what was going on. This seems like low-level sloppiness probably to me, but it blew the whole case. Can you imagine the, the, the angry, heated phone calls and emails that went out after this? You're telling me this whole case is out the window because of this stupid thing, and how much, now you still gotta pay the bill for all the, right? All those costs. And I look at, I, I work in, uh, with a lot of hospitals. We've got a hospital bed. Anytime someone's on a hospital bed, you can't get somebody else into it. Same thing with courtrooms. Our courtrooms are so jammed. We're tying up this courtroom. Somebody else with a case can't get into it either. So we're slowing the wheels of justice by this process as well. So if this person had done something a little bit differently, we, none of this would have happened. The, the signer can sign in the past and can bring it to a notary, a document that has been signed. And a lot of us get uncomfortable with that because it feels so weird. 
but an acknowledgement can be signed in the past by the signer, but then they must still bring it personally to the notary to have it signed. And so in this case, he did sign it in the past. He, <laughs> it would have behooved him to maybe pull into port for a minute. I, really, that's what it came down to. Get off the boat, get something notarized. Yeah, he did sign it in the past because he, then he sent it over to her. But just a reminder that acknowledgments in most cases can be signed in the past as long as that person then personally appears and comes to the notary and says, I signed it in the past. The key on this one was the personal appearance. He wasn't there. He wasn't there. And there are some very convoluted ways around this. There's something in California law and in other states called the proof of execution by subscribing witness where Bessenier could have had a friend come fly over and then have another credible witness and another, I mean, multiple steps. But those are, it's way too much work. Just have them add that little sentence and you're done, right? And, and the reality is they probably were spending a lot of time on the analysis of the larger case and not spending a lot of time researching obscure notary exceptions and, and exceptions in the, in the rules of court in, in Delaware. So the tragedy is that this could have easily been avoided. But like everything in life, Everything's 2020 when we look back at that one thing that we did wrong, right? We make mistakes every day that hopefully no one is uh, filming. Uh, <laughs> hint, hint. <laughs> if the notary did this uh, perjury thing, yeah. then she could be accused of practicing law. No, that's, a, well, th well, she could certainly be accused of perjury. So in California, the language, uh, many of you from California know that back in 2008, they added some language at the end of the boilerplate, at the end of the notarial wording that says, I swear under penalty of perjury that the above is correct. And what is the above? The above is that I, the notary, checked ID, made sure the person was there, made sure that was their signature. So that's a good point. I don't know what the notarial wording looks like in Pennsylvania, and it would have to be back at that time. But in California, you're exactly right. In California, I'm guilty of perjury because I'm swearing under penalty of perjury that I did that, and I did not do that. So that's a very good point. Um, maybe, maybe practicing law as well? Maybe. That's debatable. So whether her researching it was putting forward, really the attorney, I, that would get stopped at the attorney, I think, because she's working for an attorney, and that attorney would have to then be responsible for whether that was correct or not. But yeah, you want to be careful about practicing law as well. I, here's what happened, I think. I think they were going through the deposition, and they saw an email from Bessenye that said, we got a notary problem. And I think like a bunch of sharks, they said, what is that notary problem? And they went straight to it, and they took out their microscopes, and they figured it out. He's over there, she's over there. Every time we call him, he's over there. He was not over here. Done. I don't think that, could they have challenged, yeah, you can challenge any notarization. I don't think that would have been a strategy. I think that would have been a waste of time because there's a specific exception that says it's okay to have it be done elsewhere. I think they would have left that alone. But when, I think the smoking gun was that email. We got a notary problem, two minutes later, never mind. What happened in two minutes when you're two, you know, 3,000 miles away or whatever? And I think that's probably what happened. So the question is, I wanted to go work in a courtroom, now you've scared me, and to that I say, I hope I didn't scare you, because nothing I've said should have scared you about being in a courtroom. In fact, none of this even happened in the courtroom. We never even got to the courtroom. We never made it to the courtroom. And then the second piece is what's the most risky thing. Really, it's, it's impossible to say. It's what we, the history moves forward, and someone steps in up. We all step in a pothole every day. None of us is perfect. The reality is which one does somebody make an issue about and then you know, turn their microscopes on. So I would say don't worry, really, that's what E&O is for. Get some E&O and do whatever the heck you want to do and do it as honestly and as straightforward as you can. And as a member of the NNA, you get stuck, you call. That's it, that's it, you're gonna be fine. Do not be worried, do not be worried. I, I, I like to worry people enough to get some E&O, but then stop at that point, because that's why you get it, and then stop. And then go live your dreams because that's what you got it for. You don't want to be too afraid to go out and do work. You do, whatever you were going to do, go do it. But get a little bit of E&O just in case, and you'll be fine. So good question. Okay, so the gentleman's question is, could this not have been done online? And, and uh, this was, a, I believe this was a uh, 1997 case, I think. Um, 2012, thank you, okay. I think the, the, the remote notarization wasn't an option at that time. So I think now, possibly yes. But again, proceed with caution. I think there's a lot of pros about remote notarization, and there's a lot of we don't know yet about uh, remote notarization and so for me I would do it old school in this case just because if there's a pathway the, the rules of court if there's if there's three different ways to do it laid out by Delaware I'm gonna pick one of those three ways and if remote notarization is listed as one of them I'll do it but if it's not I might do it old school until they add it and the court moves very slowly to add things and the court moves very slowly with anything technological they're always in the Stone Age technologically in the courtrooms so I would do it one of those three ways but could it be done and would it be legal that's a great question. That's a great question. I don't know the answer. It depends.
All right, let's keep moving. All right, next case. So this one, Vancouver v. Catris. You've probably heard mention of this. I've heard mention of this case several times. Uh, presentation just yesterday I was at, they were talking about this. And I pulled it out of my bag. And they're like, would you just walk around with Vancouver v. Catris everywhere you go? And I said, of course. But the reality is I'm talking about it at this presentation, which is why I had it. So this is a case that, that this case was ultimately, the ending of this story is ultimately overturned. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But this case leaves a big mark on the notary world, and we're going to talk about what, what do I mean by that. So even though this case has a part three, really, and we'll talk about that, let's talk about the bulk of the meat of this case, because this is a big case in the notary world. And this has to do with notaries making mistakes. This has to do with who's responsible, and employers, and whether they have liability, and who, who do we go after when things go wrong. So Vancouver v. Cotris, this is a 2008 case. Um, it, has, it was in Illinois, it has to do with personal appearance, forged signature, maybe. The reality is we don't know what happened here. This is like one of those forensic files episodes. We don't know exactly what went down. Um, Vancouver sought justice after a document signed by him exposed to not signed by him. So let's talk about the, the facts of the case. Another convoluted one. Don't get caught up in the names because once again we're going to get derailed into a notary issue. So. There's this group, this investment club. It's a bunch of guys hanging out, probably talking business and coming up with ideas and plans, throwing some money around. There's a guy named Brown who wants to buy this house and fix it up and resell it. But he doesn't have money, so he goes to Vancouver and goes, Vancouver, can I borrow like 100,000? Vancouver says, great. So he sets up a trust with this bank. The bank then gives a note of $110,000. Brown buys the house for $78,000, fixes it up, tries to sell it, it doesn't sell. So now he's sitting on it, and Vancouver's like, hey, Brown, where's my money? Give me my money, Brown. What's going on? Where's my money, Brown? They finally call this guy Boatwright, mutual friend, probably in the investment club. Boatwright comes around, looks at the house, offers some suggestions, and then flies off to some corporation he's starting. Time goes by, and finally, Vancouver, the original lender of the $100,000, says, Hey, Boatwright, I'll give you, I'll sell you my interest in getting money back from Brown, because I'm done with it, if you'll give me some interest in your company. And Boatwright says, all right, that's cool, I'll do that. So Boatwright and his business partner go into a Kinko's, get some stuff notarized, the deal is done. Brown then now owes his money to Boatwright. And Boatwright says, I'm going to give you a deal, Brown. I'm going to, you now owe like $117,000 with interest on this thing. I'm going to let you off the hook for 90. So Brown calls his buddy, Catris and says, hey, Catris, can I borrow like $90,000? I gotta pay this boat ride guy off. If I sell this house, I'll give you whatever the profit is. Brown give, Catris gives Brown the money. Brown pays off boat ride. Boat ride goes on about his way. Brown sells the house, makes a little bit of money, pays off Catris. Everybody goes on about their way, okay? Complicated, I know. It took me a while to sort that one out. And my hotel room's got like those little strings of yarn all over the <laughs> pin, push pins everywhere on the wall. Um, not really. Um, so. Everything's great, except for the part where we went to Kinko's to get Vancouver's documents notarized, because later on, Vancouver says, hey, I'm gonna, I, I, I wanna, I goes to the bank and says, I wanna cash uh, in on my money, I wanna get my $100,000 $100, back, and they say, what are you talking about? This has all been handled already. You went to Kinko's, got some stuff notarized. Vancouver says, what are you talking about? I never went to Kinko's. I was never there. Vancouver never went to Kinko's. So Boatwright and his business partner went to Kinko's to get two documents notarized with Vancouver's signature on one of them, and Vancouver was never there. So what are we gonna do with this? Big mess, right? So the case now, and so what happens, what that means is a bunch of people, all those people I mentioned, a bunch of them were owed money that they can't get at now. Cause like, what are you talking about? It's already, you already waived this. You gave it away to somebody else. I, I didn't give it away to anybody else. I mean, I don't even know if Vancouver even really made that agreement or if they just made the whole thing up, right? All right, so now Vancouver's pissed and Brown's pissed and Catris is pissed, everybody's pissed. Um, and Boatwright's like, I got paid. <laughs> All right. Although he's not happy about it right now because now we got to talk to Boatwright and say, what exactly happened, Boatwright? Okay, so that's the layout. So this case is very interesting to me for what it stands for. And what we're going to talk about is what does the law say in Illinois, but also they bring in big gun, notary expert witness. Who's the biggest notary expert uh, in the world? Michael Clausen. They bring in our very own Michael Clausen. And this whole, this case is long, by the way. I spent a long time reading this case. Michael Clausen is in like two thirds of it, saying they should have done this, should have done that. Boom, 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 boom. And he's right. There's a lot of things that should have been done better. But it's really interesting in that what it is about, in my opinion, is Michael saying we should have done all of these things 
and the law saying, no, you really only had to do this, and the debate about who's right, you know? And, and this, in my mind, was, as I'm reading this, it's kind of the debate between me and Michael. And Michael's a very good friend of mine. I have nothing but the utmost respect for him. He's a hero to me. But I'm kind of the guy that's like, well, the law says you only have to do this, man. And, and he's like, you gotta do better. You gotta do better. And so that's really what this case, in my opinion, is about. So we're gonna start with, um, in witnessing a signature of the notary public, this is from the case, must determine either from personal knowledge or from satisfactory evidence that the signature is that of the person appearing before the notary. We know that, we know that. But what happened was there was a, a guy in Kinko's and Boatwright and his partner were in Kinko's and when they left, they had a notarized document of Vancouver who wasn't there. That's all we know. We do not know anything else. We do not know anything else besides that. And then we start talking about the liability of the employer. Why? Because if we're suing, who do we really want here? We're at a Kinko's? Do we really want that kid that did something we don't know what? No, we want Kinko's. Why? Because Kinko's has the deep pockets. Deep pockets. If you're suing for right or for wrong, you want the deep pockets. I'm not making a judgment call, but that's what happened. So they want Kinko's. Was it Kinko's fault? We gotta talk, and as you know now, Kinko's has now been bought out by, I think in 2004, bought out by FedEx and is now FedEx office. Um, so let's see what we want. So this is, so the two issues here, did this person notarize correctly or what did he do? And then is Kinko's on the hook for it. So what is the purpose of the notarization? So again, I like these little things because it for me it's very inspirational. It's very, it's very like, this is what it's about to be a notary. It's a big deal. Purpose of the notarization is to prevent fraud and forgery. The notary acts as an official and unbiased witness to the identity of the person who comes before the notary. This is a big deal. And this dude, I don't know what this dude did. And I don't know what the uh, boat ride did. I don't know who to blame. But something shady went down. The fate of the notary. So the notary, his name was Albert, but we'll just call him the notary because we've got too many characters in this story. The notary was named as a defendant, but he escaped for $30,000. Now, what is that about? So I was lucky enough when I presented the last time to have Michael Clausen sit in the back. Um, and I had to bite my tongue when I was like, I disagree with some of this, Michael. No, he and I disagree all the time. Um, the, that was the amount of the notary's bond. So they got his bond and off he went. But keep in mind, the thing about a bond, people don't know this. In many or most cases, that bonds company is going to come back after you and say, hey, I'll bear 30 grand. So that is not a win. Like, oh, I got a bond. Okay, great. Well, I got to come up with this 30 grand still. So again, you know, I'm a fan of E&O because E&O is there to take care of things, honest mistakes that you might have made. But a bond does not free money for you. A bond pays to the victim, and then you're going to be stuck in many cases with having to deal with what comes next. So he gets out. And actually, I'm kind of bummed that he got out of the story too soon. Because I had lots of questions for this guy. Uh, and I'm sure they did too. Um, there's a lot of discussion about how sloppy he was. And you are going to get caught up in how sloppy he was. But I, my, my voice on the side is going to be asking you, but did that have to do with what happened here? Because there's something in the case, there's the majority in the case and then the dissent. The, the way it works in, the, in these appellate cases is that you've got these justices and they review what happened in the case before, the original case. In the original case, Kinko's gets nailed for everything. We're on appeal now, and these justices, they decide. They say, well, what do we think happened here? And the majority wins. The minority gets to, if they want, write something called a dissent. And the dissent is my favorite, because those are the grumbling people who lost. And they're like, well, this is what should have happened. And theirs is always the juicier part of the story. I won't tell you who which one is which yet, because I don't want to spoil it yet. Okay, so notary's out, but we're not done talking about the notary yet. So this is some of the stuff, I'm presuming this came from the deposition, although it found its way into the actual case itself. Did the notary insist on a photo ID? They asked this guy, the Albert, the notary, do you ask for a, um, they grilled him on how he practices uh, as a notarization. And let's step back for a second. Let's talk about what Kinko's did to set this up. Kinko's decided it was gonna start offering notary services, which they came to quickly regret after this case. <laughs> they decided to start offering notary services and they said, you know what, we're gonna provide a training, too, as well. And it's interesting in that Illinois law at the time, and I think still today maybe, but don't quote me on that, says all you have to do to be a notary is familiarize yourself with the statute. Read it, be familiar. So no, Kinko said, we're gonna go above and beyond. We're gonna create a notary training program. So they, they hired this guy who's a trainer uh, that works for Kinko's, and they said, come up with a training program, which he did. And then they sent a bunch of the notaries from the different stores over to one place, not notaries yet, but the people who are gonna become notaries, had this guy train them and then sent them back. So this guy was trained, in theory, by this other Kinko's trainer guy, and we're looking at who do we blame? Do we blame the notary? Do we blame the trainer guy? Do we blame Kinko's as a whole? Do we blame everybody? So they asked him, do you check for photo ID? He goes, no, I don't check for photo ID. A signature is good enough. So if someone hands me like a social security card, I just match the signature on the social security card. 
to the signature on the document and we're good to go. And they're like, well, how does that even prove that it's the same guy? And like, I don't know, man. I don't work at Kinko's anymore. <laughs> and really, and he did it. And he did it. He was gone. He was probably like, what the heck is all this, man? I worked there for like a year and why are we talking about this? Okay. So again, the training, let's mention this. The tra so this is the analysis on the training provided by Kinko's employer. Trainer was not a notary, which they made a lot of big deal about. I don't know if I'm that upset that he wasn't a notary. Would it be better if he's a notary? Sure. But can you, can you train someone and not be a notary? Yeah, I think so. It was three, uh, two, to th two to three days uh, training. And um, what was interesting is this guy, he, the trainer, he, he took all the, the statutes and he read them and he made a little packet. And then he watched three different NNA videos and he put on this whole training thing. He sends it off to Kinko's corporate saying, what do you think? And they never send anything back. He never hears back, you know? And so then he says, hey, just to be sure, this is the trainer, Kinko's, can I go uh, take a notary class? Why don't I go take a notary class? And, and they said, ah, it's 300 bucks. No, <laughs> no. So he never gets his training plan back. He wanted to go to take the notary training and they didn't let him. According to the case, according to the case, this is all alleged by me, but it's in the case. I'm talking to cameras right now, I have to be careful. <laughs> Kinko's doesn't exist anymore. All right. Um, not because of this case, I hope. All right, so no testing was performed. He didn't test them afterwards, but there's no testing in Illinois anyway. There's no testing. Trainer relied on his own reading of the statutes, did not consult a notary or attorney. I mean, come on, he's not gonna uh, consult an attorney. They asked him to put a training packet together. So this is, this is what I was just talking about. He never heard back. He wanted to do the training. It cost three or $400. They said, nope, no thanks. Um, notary training in Illinois is not legally required. The notary statute does not mandate any particular training and it only requires a notary to read and be familiar with the statutes. So who are we siding towards here? I mean, Kinko's is like, we wanna provide notaries to the public, and there's no training required, but we're gonna build a training. We're going above and beyond. And now are we on the hook for that? Of course, maybe they were super sloppy. Maybe they went above and beyond in a really sloppy, messy way that led to poor results. And so that's something we, we need to be worried about. And really, this goes to the heart of whether employers and businesses generally want to employ notaries and deal with whatever might come from that. Okay, so the manager of that particular store was not interested in becoming a notary himself because he's too busy putting out fires and because he was not willing to take on the personal liability of being a notary public. I'm not doing that. Are you crazy? I'm not doing that. Um, but I'll let that guy do it. He can do it. What's the worst that could go wrong? Vancouver Vicatris is the worst thing that could go wrong. Okay, he never reviewed and was never asked to approve uh, any notarizations that were formed in the store. So, I mean, again, I could spin that either way. He's a manager of a Kinko's. He doesn't know about being a notary. How is he supposed to manage that? But then is someone, should someone be managing that? So then in comes Michael Claussen, the greatest uh, notary expert of all time, and he testifies and really just rips apart. I mean, just, uh, they, they ripped him apart. They basically said, um, he keeps a journal in a three ring binder. A three ring binder can be opened and pages can be removed. He didn't lock up the binder, he didn't lock up the journal. He didn't lock up the stamp. When he left, he left the stamp with the manager and he left the, the journal with the, the manager, which by the way is now lost, it doesn't exist anymore. Just nailed him, nailed him, nailed him, nailed him, nailed him. Now me, the little devil on the shoulders I'm reading the case is like, the law doesn't say you had to do any of that stuff. And so that's tough, right? The law doesn't say that you had to do any of that stuff. And Michael's like, you should have done all this. And he's right, you would be much better. And we wouldn't have been in this position had you done all that. But it doesn't say, Illinois law doesn't say you have to lock up the stamp. It says you have to keep it safe. Doesn't say you have to keep a journal at all. Doesn't talk about what to do when you need to, when you leave, who you have to give it to. So did this create a huge mess? Absolutely. Would that mess have been present, prevented if they did what Michael Claussen said? You bet. However, were they required to do that? Can we nail them for not doing that? In the law, there's a duty. You have to have a duty assigned to you by law. If you have a duty assigned to you and you fail, then you're on the hook. But if you don't have a duty, you can't be in trouble. It's sort of like, and don't quote me on this, but it's sort of like, I'm oversimplifying. If you're walking by and someone's drowning, if you don't try to help them, you keep right on going. In many cases, you have no liability. But as soon as you stop and try to help them, if you do something wrong, then you may be on the hook. So it's this, if you assume a duty, and that's the case here, they did assume training. Are they now on the hook because they tried to, to do training? All right, so the Model Notary Act comes in. And those of you who don't know, Model Notary Act is a bunch of uh, individuals who've come together and, and, and created this, wouldn't it be great if this was the notary law in the land? And people will look to, when they're trying to improve their state's local laws, they will look to model acts and say, hey, let's steal from 
this model notary act. Let's make things better. These experts have come together. And so he quotes a lot of that, but the reality is the model notary act is not the law. And so to nail Kinko's for something that is not the law is, it's, it's, it's questionable. Because this is, you do it this way and you're golden. You're gonna get A plus and all the extra credit points. But this is not the law. So in the lower court, they basically had Kinko's on the hook for everything because they said that you took the effort to train, you trained poorly, this guy obviously made a huge mess, something bad went wrong here, Kinko's you're on the hook for all of it. And then on appeal, they looked at it again and they said, and we're not gonna get into the specifics, but they looked at what's called common law claims and they said, Kinko's we think you're still on the hook for that, but according to the statute, you're probably not still on the hook for that. In the end, they decided that Kinko's was still on the hook for all of it. They basically said, once you trained, you should have done it right and you should have supervised and you didn't, and so therefore that you're on the hook for it and you gotta pay everybody back. And now they don't offer notarizations anymore. <laughs> and those of you, I come, when I come through uh, to this conference from my room, uh, hotel room, if I come down on the C level, it's that bottom level, and you walk right past the FedEx office. And as I was, as I was walking here this morning, I stopped in, hey, do you guys notarize? And the lady's like, the lady's like no. <laughs> and I said, just not here or not anywhere? And she goes, not anywhere. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, all right. So the dissent, and I love the dissent. The dissent is this cranky guy who writes a dissent, and he's like, first of all, duty to train and duty to supervise are two totally different things. Train, they did train, and I don't, this is him talking, I don't even think they had the duty to train, but they did. And the guy, the, the trainer guy sounds like he was a good trainer. Just because this kid did it all wrong doesn't mean, I mean, I teach notary classes, not everybody that leaves my class says exactly the things that I want them to say. And so I had someone call me recently and they said, Mike, I can notarize for this person, but I know I can notarize for her, but is it okay if she's asleep? <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> Do not tell anyone that you took my class. <laughs> so just because you train does not mean the train E is following the rules, right? So the other thing, duty to supervise, comes into play if you know as an employer that someone has messed up and then you didn't watch them afterwards. They had no reason to believe this guy messed up. Now, something went wrong, we know. Either, well, we've got a few options, right? We'll have to use our imagination. Either he turned away to go answer the phone or something, and his stamp was sitting right there, and they just went, bam, and moved on. Or he was sloppy, and he's like, I don't know, I Googled it, and the stamping, right? Or they said, hey, if you do this for us, there's something in it for you, right? I mean, I think those are probably the three likely scenarios. And actually, I, I was, while I was at the, um, before this session, I was Googling, some fallout discussion about this, and there's a bunch of people talking, these are just people talking on the internet, but they're like, every time I would go in there, there would be people stamps just sitting around unattended, so I don't know that that's true. But I think part of that goes to people not realizing the importance of keeping that stamp where nobody can get at it, and how much damage can be done if you leave it unattended. You cannot let the thing out of your sight. And so it may be as simple as he turned away. We don't know, we don't know what happened. But the other thing that this guy says is factors regarding the sloppy notary were irrelevant to what happened. In fact, he has a great quote in the case, and I'm not quoting it exactly right, but there was a lot of talk about the fact that he didn't keep the stamp locked up and that he um, didn't follow the journal uh, as good as he should have. And remember, there's no legal requirement for a journal. So in the dissent, the guy says, <laughs> the justice says, they could have carved the information on a stone tablet and they could have locked that stamp in a vault with security guards around it and got every piece of information about this person's whole life and this, whole, this same thing would have gone down. So in other words, all these things that we were saying that he did wrong, true, but even if he had done all those right, it might not have prevented this. And also, all the training in the world, if this guy was shady and it was a criminal act, all the training in the world is not gonna prevent a criminal act. He's gonna do what he's gonna do, right? So. At the end, and also the government has supervisor theory, I like this, the justice also says, well, so if Kinko's is on the hook for all the notaries that work for Kinko's, doesn't that make the Secretary of State on the hook for all the notaries? You know, at some point, you know, he's, he's joking, but he's sort of like, how far are we gonna go on this, right? Because the Secretary of State's responsible in, in many places for training. Are we gonna say anyone that does something wrong is the fault of the Secretary of State? Um, the dissent, um, this, this is a quote in the dissent, when I kind of agree with it. In my view, this is their quote, affirmance of the trial court here leaves an entity that had virtually nothing to do with the injury potentially liable for the whole verdict and the real perpetrators of the fraud possibly off the hook. This result is unjust in my view. Now, that's, I agree with that. Um, if they were sloppy, if they were super sloppy and careless, then I don't agree. 
But if they really did all these things to try to make it right and this guy was just a joker and he didn't take it seriously. And also, I'm a manager. If your manager's not taking it seriously, then your staff is not taking it seriously. So it may just be that the, the busy manager who didn't know the rules and couldn't be bothered sends that message down to his team, right? Um, this case, this is a 2008 case. The, this, case, this case gets all the attention. What doesn't get really any attention is in 2010, this went up to the Supreme Court in Illinois and was overturned again. And the Supreme Court basically said, no, we're not holding Kinko's uh, responsible for all those things. Essentially, they agreed with the dissent. Um, but this case, I was doing some reading on it before I came here, has really sent a chilling effect to businesses generally of saying, you know what, we're not going to do that. We aren't. It's not worth the risk. And, and, and Michael Clausen in the back, he, he made a comment where he said, uh, during my presentation, he said, they went, this case, they could have settled for a few hundred thousand dollars on the front end. This case went on for like 10 plus years. And they just, I mean, the amount of money that they put into it, and I said, why? And, and he said, we don't know for sure. Maybe they were just afraid. Maybe they were the poster child for all businesses everywhere saying, we don't want to be on the hook for this. Or maybe they were worried a bunch of people were going to come out of the woodwork and say, hey, I had a notarization at Kinko's too. So I don't know, but if they went on for that, they ended up paying a, a massive amount of money in the end. And sadly, if not now, you can't get any notary services. I don't know if that's a good ending, but that's the ending. So what we learned from this, always insist on personal appearance. And then we want to educate ourselves, obviously. Supplement and refresh your basic training. And then don't be pressured by third parties. Was this guy pressured? Did they lean on him? I don't know. We don't know. We don't know. Do, we, do not leave your supplies unguarded. Seriously. In California, the rule is you must keep your stamp and your journal in a locked and secured area under your direct and exclusive control. So you, that thing must be locked down. And even if your law doesn't say that, lock it down anyway. Essentially, in layman's terms, a bunch of people got screwed and we're never going to find out what happened and who, who should have paid who. We're never going to find out. We're never going to find out because this kid at the Kinko's messed up. And so we'll never get justice, or a lot of people will never get justice. And some people got away with some shady business. The, I didn't mention, and it doesn't change much in the fact pattern, but just to be thorough, um, the notary looked at the document that he supposedly notarized, and he said, yeah, that's my stamp, but I, that's not how I signed my name. They had written his name out, or someone had written his name out, in this very full, formal way um, that he never writes his name. So, I mean, he... The notary. The notary said, yeah, that's my stamp. I think they grabbed his stamp when he wasn't looking, stamped it, and then they went, okay, let's write his name on there, boom, 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 and let's run out the door. Although, you have to wonder, there must have been some kind of shenanigans, because you're not going to just show up without Vancouver and hope and count on the notary to turn away for a minute, unless who knows, the two guys, you distract him, and I grab his stamp, right? Because you, you know, there's two dudes there, so, I mean, because the plan, if that was your plan, and you were banking on him ignoring the stamp, you, you've got to help him ignore that stamp. Or maybe they hung out at a Kinko's for the day before. I'm thinking of some Better Call Saul episodes. Maybe you hung out in Kinko's and observed, this guy is not paying that close attention to his stamp. I think this is our guy. It could be any of those things. And even if your law doesn't say it, get a journal and use a journal. There's journals in the, in the exhibit hall. Very inexpensive. Some people are like, eh, it's a little bit of extra work. That is what is going to protect you if anything goes wrong. I can't remember what I notarized last month. I can't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday morning. So that journal will tell you what you did and more importantly will tell people what you didn't do. There are stories that I've heard and you probably have too about individuals who will go pull uh, documents that are recorded in the recorder's office or wherever with a notary stamp on it, they don't care whose, and then they'll Photoshop it, lift that stamp, and then they can put that stamp on whatever they want. And if that's your stamp, you are notarizing stuff and you're not even there. So the people who think, I'm the most perfect notary ever, I don't make mistakes, you don't have to be making a mistake. Somebody else is notarizing with your stamp. And what would you do in that case? You'd say, great, here's my journal. Guess what's not in that journal? All of those things. So number one, please get a journal. And you're going to hear, not just from me, you're going to hear from everybody. Get a journal, required or not. But two, fill that journal out religiously and consistently and carefully. It's not hard, just fill in the blanks. But if you get a journal and you fill it out in a sloppy way, that might be even worse. Because I know Michael does expert testimony, and I've been called a couple of times. I haven't ever done expert testimony, but I know what they're going to ask. Depending on which side is paying me, they're going to say, prove that this notary is consistent and great, or they're going to say, prove that this notary is a total inconsistent disaster. And so you want to be very consistent in your, in your documentation. But it's not hard. It's not hard to do that, and it doesn't cost hardly any money. I was looking at, you can get a bunch of journals for under $15, so, and they last for a long time. I would say that consult your local, what, what does the law say, and also what does the Secretary of State or whoever um, is responsible for the notaries in that state. I would say be hitting at least that minimum 
Now, if there's no journal requirement, then there is no minimum, right? But then this case really speaks to be careful because the minimum may not be the minimum. The minimum may be bumped up a little bit. Michael, I can imagine Michael in there, you know, waxing poetic on how we should be doing it. I, I would have fallen for it too. I mean, I don't mean fallen for it like he was wrong. I would have soaked it all in and said, this guy is fantastic. Absolutely, we should be doing it this way. And we should, as the NNA, we should be, and members of the NNA, we should be raising the bar on ourselves. But I think, to me, this case says to the notary, and this guy was a disaster. But if you're following the law, that might not be good enough. We might be wanting to read that NNA magazine a little more closely and do, incorporating some of those things in, even if the law doesn't say it. You're never going to get penalized for going above. You're never going to get nailed for doing more. And so for me, the question would be, what is the minimum threshold according to the state? And then really, if it's in the journal, just fill it up. It takes a little more time, sure. But you know what takes a lot of time? Sitting in a courtroom and, uh, and crying every day for like five years. Some laws have very specific prescriptions as to what needs to be listed. California is one of them. California says you gotta tag all these bases. And it doesn't say you have to put them on separate lines, but the Secretary of State says we'd like things to be each document on a separate line. Um, so I would say everyone consult your own state. Um, it, most journals, if you buy a commercial journal and you just follow the steps that are in the journal, you're probably gonna be safe. To me, the journal is my friend. Because I hope I'll never need it, but on that day when I do, thank you, journal. Thank you, journal. Because that journal is what's going to save me. Because I don't do the wrong thing. I do the right thing. And use those comments. If something weird happens, use those comments. Don't put, oh boy, I think I really screwed this one up, and I hope nobody, <laughs> hope nobody finds out. I left my journal uh, for like 10 minutes, and some dude grabbed it. But um, I hope I don't end up in Mike Phillips' presentation in a few years. Um, I think that, that you can't go wrong, and I, I'm not surprised. Doctors and lawyers, generally, we're not going to follow that rule, even if it was the rule. We're not going to follow that rule, so, but we're not going to worry about them. We're going to worry about us. We're going to document it. You don't have to have a journal, but for me, get a journal. It's just so easy. It's just so, if you can prevent disaster, and really it just goes to thoroughness, and people seeing you use it, it just, I mean, it just classes up the whole thing. So if and that's another thing, too. Take your journals with you when you leave. Take your stamp with you, it's got your name on it. Take your journal with you, it doesn't matter who paid for it. Unless there's a law that I don't know about, every law that I know, or if there's no law, take, this, take it with you. You are the keeper of those things. You are responsible. And if you're not sure, contact your Secretary of State and say, what am I supposed to do with this? Uh, call the NNA hotline for help, and then again, get some E&O. All right, so the, 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 on this one, this guy, total train wreck, we don't know what happened and also the question about whether uh, the supervisors are responsible. And we've seen a lot of uh, movement in this area after the foreclosure uh, disasters of 2007, 2008 about whether or not we can hold supervisors liable. In some cases we can, some cases we can. It's still sort of um, not totally clear. I know that as the notary, even if I love my boss and we have a great relationship, I know that if something ever hits the fan, everyone's gonna say, Mike, hey, we love you, but uh, good luck with that. And so I want to make sure that I'm protected, or if they claim that I'm protected, I've seen something in writing that shows that I am included on whatever sort of insurance or protection that they have. All right, we're going to do one last case. This one's fun. This one's juicy, and it's fast. It's Galetta v. Galetta. This is Gary and Michelle. Gary and Michelle got married. Gary and Michelle got married uh, back in 1997, and I, I don't know the details, but it sounds like Gary was loaded, and Michelle was not. And so they got a prenup. They decided to get a prenup. And um, 10 plus years went by, Gary was done. Gary's like, I'm out, I'm leaving. Gary files for divorce. Michelle also then files for divorce and also files to say that the prenup is invalid. So where, where are we going with this? What is the, the situation on the, why would they think that it was invalid? So here's what happened. Let's go back to 1997, just before the wedding. Gary hires an attorney. This is Gary's attorney. Gary hires an attorney, sets up a prenup, has the whole prenup, and then on the last page, he's got a place for Gary to get it notarized and the notarial wording. Same page underneath that, place for Michelle to get it notarized and the notarial wording. Now, sometimes you'll see both people signing at the same time. There's nothing wrong with having two separate notarial wordings. Um, Gary goes off to the bank to some gentleman who notarizes his, and then Michelle goes to some other notary by herself and gets hers notarized, and all is right with the world. Until it's divorce time, <laughs> and until somebody takes out the microscope and looks very closely at the notarial wording, 
and notices that Michelle's notarial wording, you guys don't understand notarial wording, right? The boilerplate at the bottom that says, I swear I did all of these things. Michelle's is perfect, but Gary's is missing a few words. There's a few words missing on the notarial wording for Gary. And the question becomes, is that a deal breaker? Is that a deal breaker? And now keep in mind, this was drafted by the same person, paid for by Gary. I mean, the irony here is thick. Gary's like, I paid you guys to do this. It's, it's wrong on the first boilerplate, and it's right on the second boilerplate. All typed by the same person. So obviously, just a mistake, right? So now we got to figure out what to do with this. And it's not just a, hey, let's vote on it. As I said before, it's what does the law say? What does the precedent say? This is a New York case. So let's, let's break this down. So Michelle, I've already explained this. Michelle sought a determination. The prenup was invalid. She and Gary had signed it. It's, again, it's undisputed that they both signed it. In some of these cases, people are like, I didn't sign that. You know, Vancouver, I didn't sign that. In this one, Gary and Michelle, yeah, I signed it. Yeah, I got it notarized. Everything was legit. But the words, a couple words are missing. Is it enough? I can see some of you have chosen sides already, maybe <laughs> based on personal experience, possibly. All right. So it's undisputed that the signatures are authentic. And there's no claim that anybody was forced to sign it. Part of the prenup, part of the idea in some of the case law talks about, can we cure these things? The word cure, can we fix it? Can we cure it after the fact? And part of the dangers of curing it after the fact is that it's not just about whether they signed it and whether they were there. It's also about, did they contemplate at that time, going forward, before they got married, did they contemplate what they are getting into? And if you fix that five, six years later, can you really truly say that you're contemplating that in the same way that you would have back then? So that's something to keep in mind. That's one of the, the theories here. The rule in New York at the time, and maybe still now, says that prenups must be notarized to the same level that a deed that's being recorded. That's a high standard. Why is it so high? It doesn't get into it, but I assume that many prenups probably include references to property and things like that. And so, hey, if there's property involved, let's make sure that you record, you notarize it to the same, we're going to have the same bar on a prenup that we would have on recording a deed. So that part is the law, and there's no way around that. And that's fine, they got them notarized. The question is, is it valid with the missing words? They observed that, the, this is the court, recognized there's no exception to the requirement that it be notarized the same way that a deed would be notarized. So in like the other cases we talked about where there are some exceptions, on this one there's none. It must be notarized. And it was notarized, but was it notarized correctly? So in the certificate of, in his certificate of acknowledgement, it's missing the phrase, to me known and known to me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's missing seven words. Probably out of like 250 words. Seven words. Do we care? Is that enough? What do you think? Let's, let's take a vote. Is that enough? Should we, should we throw it out? Who wants to throw it out? Oh, wow, okay. And who wants to say, come on, man, seven words. Give me a break. We're keeping it. Okay, we've got six people in the room based on the vote. <laughs> Way to commit, everybody. They're like, we're being filmed. We don't want to get this wrong. I don't want to be wrong on film. Can you superimpose a bunch of arms when you, uh... come on, let me do this again. Who thinks we should, who thinks that, who cares about those missing words? It should stand. Come on, guys. We're going, for, it's legal, it's legal. We're, the prenup is legal. Okay, we're throwing it out. What about we're throwing it out? Okay, all right, all right, we're mixed. And this, now there's only about 20 people in the room, but that's okay. All right, so absent the admitted language, the certificate does not indicate that the notary public knew the husband. So here's what we start to get into. These are not, this is where the court's starting to go with this. These are not just any words. Remember I talked about in the beginning, corp concepts, personal appearance, satisfactory evidence. Signature is the right signature. These are not just any words. This says, this gets to the, do we know this person? Is this person who they claim to be? So that becomes relevant to the court. This wasn't just a few words at the end of some sentence that were just fluffed. This is one of the elements that we care so much about as notaries. So absent the omitted language, the certificate does not indicate that the notary public knew or the husband had ascertained through some form of proof that he was the person described in the prenup. New York courts have long held that an acknowledgement that fails to include a certification of this fact is defective. So that's not good. Can the error be cured? So this is on the lower case. The lower case said, um, the lower case said maybe it can be cured. And what does cure mean? So there's other cases that say, in certain cases, we've said maybe it can be fixed. There was a case they referenced where they didn't get it notarized at all, this other couple. Didn't get it notarized at all. And they said maybe in that case, with the right kind of additional evidence, we might be able to build up a foundation and say we're good to go. 
But in that case, they did not put forward very good evidence. So they said, no. But what they did by saying, maybe we can cure it in some cases, they've opened the door to all future cases saying, well, if it was possible to cure in that case, but they didn't meet the burden, now we gotta talk about can we cure it in every case? The court seems kind of cranky that that door was ever even opened, in my opinion. So now the question is, can we cure it? And how would we cure it? So in this case, the husband goes back to the notary at the bank from like 13 years ago, and it's probably like, please, please, please say something that you did this. And he writes something to the effect of, I always follow the rules, I always check ID, or whatever. And so this gets submitted to the court, and this is you know, his hope that this will cure the case. There's also another case that talks about how the notarial wording in New York said a certain thing, and then they changed the law and worded it slightly differently. And in that case, people had used the old language. And so they said, is the old language okay? And in that case, they said, yeah, it's okay. Because even though it's different, it tagged all the bases. It hit all the elements. So husband was basically like, look, in that case, they used the wrong language. I used the wrong language. We're good, right? And the court's like, well, they used the wrong language, but they tagged all the bases. You used the wrong language, and a whole base is missing. All right, so, the not and they acknowledge the notary may have done everything correctly. So that's the thing that's sort of um, ironic, if you will, in that in many cases, we have notarial wording that says everything was done correctly, and when people sign it, when we know probably that notary didn't do everything correctly, right, in real life. Here, we have the reverse. This guy, the bank notary, probably did everything right, but the wording says he skipped a step. He probably didn't skip a step, but the wording says he did and he didn't look at it. What I do, I've been a notary for probably more than 15 years. I have a notarial certificate with the correct wording on it every single time I notarize. I pull that out, I put it next to the wording on the document I'm gonna notarize and I just match it up, because California is very specific, and I match it up and I match it up and if it matches, I notarize the original. If it doesn't, I attach that loose certificate to the back. I do this every single time. If this bank teller would have done that, this wouldn't happen. But the bank teller probably didn't even look. He's probably busy. He's probably like, oh, it looks good to me, right? How often do you read that notarial wording? And when I read it and I compare, I'm not even necessarily comprehending it, but I'm making sure it's all there. And if it's not, I'm going to go to a loose certificate. It seems likely that the admission resulted from a typo. They admit it. It's probably just a typo. Okay, so in this case, the notary said that, that he had done this regularly. And what they were going for legally is a strategy called custom and practice. If you can show that someone like a robot does the same thing every time in their job without fail religiously, then if there's a, a time an issue where there's no documentation, you can sometimes say, if they do it every time like a robot, then they probably did it right that time. They were trying to go for this, but the court said what this notary wrote it was too vague. It wasn't like, I pull out my, I get their ID, I confirm the, the birth date, I check this, I then do this, I do this, 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 this. He basically just said, I check ID every time, love the notary, right? And so, <laughs> and, and really it was too vague. I mean, it basically might have said, I do my job, that's it. Uh, and the reality is, could he remember from 13 years ago or whatever? We would have been more suspicious if he was like, I definitely remember pulling out his ID. I mean, we would never have believed it. So what this court said was, you might be able to cure it, but that was not good enough. And that step that was missing is a critical step. And because of that, the prenup is invalid. And they threw it out. And they threw it out. We see some happy people. I can guess either your story or some of your friends and family's story. Um, so what that means for her is game on. Game on because she may or may not have been seeking you know, uh, uh, alimony or whatever. And I don't judge because I don't know these people. But what a tragedy, seven, seven words missing, and the whole thing falls apart. And I, I, I did this training, this uh, presentation last year, and Judith, who's one of the presenters, said she went right back to work, and someone came in with a prenup, and the wording was not right, and she said, get out of here, go get this fixed, get this fixed. So like immediately, like the next day, she turned this around. So this stuff will happen. So what are the takeaways on this? Practice tips, always ensure that your loose certificates are correct and up to date. Some states have exact wording that you have to follow. California is one of them, others might not. But there are, you know, if you're using loose certificates, and NNA provides loose certificates that you can use, use loose certificates. And if something is missing or vague or looks like it was written by the person themselves, just use a loose certificate because um, that is going to make sure that you're using the right wording. And also keep a journal. I don't believe this gentleman at the bank had a journal either. And it's New York, and I understand New York does not require a journal. So again, journal, check the notarial wording, 
lock your stamp up, call your NNA if you get stuck, use, get some E&O. Thank you very much for your time.